Good evening. Thank you for joining me in this Bible study as we go back to the book of Genesis. And we're finding ourselves in Genesis chapter 41 here in just a moment as we continue our series of lessons uh, that we have been looking at uh, for a couple of Sunday evenings so far, and that is life lessons from that of Joseph of the Old Testament. Um, we have covered a pretty good bit of material so far. There's still more to go. But uh, we have noted that in Joseph's life that he has been in the pit, sold into slavery by his own brothers, uh, from the pit to a prominent position uh, in the house of Potiphar, who was captain of the guard of Pharaoh. And then after successfully overcoming the temptation, the powerful temptation with Potiphar's wife, that um, even being falsely accused even of Potiphar's wife, Joseph went uh, to prison. And so last Sunday evening we considered that through all of these difficult times and the circumstances that Joseph was dealing with, that again, we have been repeating it over and over again, and that is these things did not define Joseph. They didn't define Joseph. And we noted how Joseph would be disappointed yet again in his life in chapter 40, as we noted, where after even showing genuine concern for his fellow cellmates and interpreting their dreams and service to them, the chapter ended with a chief butler not even remembering um, Joseph. So Joseph was forgotten yet again. So Joseph continued in what we've been calling his waiting room of life his waiting room. So we will find yet again that Joseph was again holding on to that dream. Remember his dreams, well, he has they haven't come true yet. <laughs> uh, but his belief, he still holds that God is good no matter what's going on in one's life. God is good all the time and God is in control. So this evening we are going to Genesis chapter 41. I hope you have your Bibles open there to Genesis 41. As uh, again, we prove all things according to God's word and not mine. And so as we go to Genesis 41, we observe how, how Joseph uh, dealt with going from pr the prison to the palace. Uh, Joseph really has survived <laughs> a lot in his life. He's, he survived a lot. He has been through numerous years and approximately 13 years of slavery and imprisonment. He has definitely had his ups and downs in his life. Then Joseph is found making a, a rather rapid transition from being a prisoner to being second in command uh, of the most powerful nation of that time. Now, what we will find interesting is that Joseph is most definitely different than how many respond and deal with such success in their life even today. So we want to study this together from our text of Genesis chapter 41. I want us to read the first seven verses to start us off here uh, regarding these dreams that we're going to be talking about in chapter 41. Look at verses, verses 1 through 7 of chapter 41. Then it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh had a dream. And behold, he stood by the river. Suddenly there came up out of the river seven cows, fine-looking and fat, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other cows came up after them out of the river, ugly and gaunt, and stood by the other cows on the bank of the river. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows. So Pharaoh awoke. He slept and dreamed a second time, and suddenly seven heads of grain came up on one stalk, plump and good. Then behold, seven thin heads, blighted by the east wind, sprang up after them, and the seven thin heads devoured the seven uh, plump and full heads. So Pharaoh awoke, and indeed it was a dream. So what we find just in the first seven verses is that Pharaoh is noted to having had two dreams. Dreams about cows and grain. <laughs> That's what we see. Uh, so we have in these dreams where ugly and gaunt uh, cows ate up the seven fine-looking and fat cows, as noted there in verse 4. And the seven thin heads of grain devoured the seven plump and full heads of grain, as noted in verse 7. So according to verse 8, as we move along through our text here, 
that it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled. This is Pharaoh, of course, after the dreams that he had. So Pharaoh uh, sends and calls for the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. And Pharaoh tells these, these, uh, these individuals his dreams, but there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. So, so again, Pharaoh, with these perplexing dreams that he has had, he wants to call these individuals that would be uh, magicians of Egypt, all its wise men, uh, get them all together to try to figure out what was going on with these dreams that he had. And so Pharaoh told them the dreams that he had stated, uh, and, and stated there was no one who could interpret them for Pharaoh. Now, what's interesting uh, to note is that in all of these highly educated leaders in Egypt, uh, those who were of uh, the scholarly class, uh, they were not able to interpret the dreams that Pharaoh had. Notice verse 9. Notice verse 9. That the chief butler spoke to Pharaoh saying, I remember my faults this day. All of a sudden... All of a sudden, the chief butler remembers something or rather someone, okay? Uh, he remembers the guy who uh, showed genuine concern for him and at one time interpreted a dream that he had. And that guy's name was Joseph. Of course, it's only two years after the fact. Uh, you know, think about that. But I must say that at this time, the chief butler tells Pharaoh of his experience with a young Hebrew man, a servant of the captain of the guard who was with him and the chief baker in jail. I want you to notice verses 10 through 13 as we go back through our text here. He says, when Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, both me and the chief baker, we each had a dream and one night he and I, each of us dreamed according to the interpretation of his own dream. Now there was a, there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a, certain of the ca a servant of the captain of the guard, and we told him and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream, and it came to pass just as he interpreted for us, so it happened. He restored me to my office, and he hanged him. So what the chief butler uh explains that the dreams that he and the chief baker had were interpreted by this young Hebrew man. And these dreams were interpreted precisely as it so happened. And as you notice, even in verse 14, that Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, that young Hebrew man that they're talking about, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Well, you know, I've, I've always thought it was interesting in, in how it's uh, mentioned there about him um, shaving and changing his clothing and, and, and all of that before he, he uh, appeared before Pharaoh. Well, uh, we could only imagine that Joseph's appearance, <laughs> being in the dungeon, <laughs> uh, may have been quite rugged uh, during his extensive stay there. Uh, so out of respect for Pharaoh, uh, Joseph would look appropriate uh, to be before Pharaoh. So that's interesting to note that. So, so we have uh, Pharaoh saying, hey, well, I want this guy that you're talking about, Joseph, to be brought before me. So that's what happens. As you notice in verse 15 and 16, uh, notice what's said there. Pharaoh said to Joseph, he said, I have had a dream and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that you can understand a dream to interpret it. So Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So, so Joseph is now before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh explains his dilemma. He explains the problem that he's having, that, you know, hey, I've had dreams. No one in the, in, in the territory can, uh, of all the scholarly people that I have uh, are not able to interpret the dream. So um, Joseph, he, 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 he wants Joseph to interpret it. But one thing that amazes me, always it, it amazes me, if you've noticed that Joseph seizes every opportunity uh, to give credit where credit is rightfully due. Did you notice that? Uh, 
Joseph says, and I underlined it there uh, for emphasis there on the chart, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So one thing I, I, I definitely think about in, in this life lesson here and, and what Joseph even teaches today is that give credit where credit is due. And that is to God. For everything that happened, for everything I, I think about this, uh, to me this would be an interesting thing to witness as Joseph is before Pharaoh and, and Pharaoh's elite scholarly folks that have gathered there. And so when Pharaoh prompts Joseph with the statement that he has heard said of Joseph that he can understand a dream to, to uh, interpret it, this was a prime opportunity for Joseph to exalt himself, for him to pridefully say, you know, thou sayest correctly, Pharaoh, and just really make himself look really, really, really good before Pharaoh. But Joseph doesn't do that. Joseph doesn't do that. Rather, he shows a great quality of character, and that is humility. Humility as he gives God the credit. And so in this very moment uh, in time, Joseph doesn't permit the horizontal view of all this power and officials and, and to get really in the way of his vertical view, okay? He is still focused on God. So in the following verses, Pharaoh tells Joseph the two dreams that he had in verses 17 through 24. And, and, and uh, so he, he tells Joseph that, and, and notice that Joseph starts out uh, to explain or interpret the, the dreams for, for Pharaoh in verse 25. And I want you to notice there in verse 25 what, what he says. The dreams of Pharaoh are one God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So Joseph explained the two dreams. He, he explains that the seven years of abundance are followed by seven years of famine. That's the significance of the dreams that Pharaoh had. But again, the focus was on God in, in the way that, that uh, Joseph interprets the dreams. Okay, He focuses it on God because God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So Joseph gave God the credit, obviously, for the interpretation of the dream. Look at verse 28. Verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Notice again verse 32 now. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God and God will shortly bring it to pass. What is it that you see in each one of those verses, verse 25, verse 28, verse 32? Well, what you see is Joseph at every opportunity Every opportunity is giving God the credit. He turns the discussion back to God. Now, I want us to consider, uh, j just, just for this moment, how often we give God the credit in our lives today. Uh, there were many in the days of Israel who forgot what they had was due to God. I mean, go back and study about the Israelites. <laughs> how often they forgot the provider. Now they lavished in their gifts and all the blessings that they had, all the provisions that they had, but they would forget the provider, the one who provides God. And those who forgot were deemed as arrogant, prideful, and they would in turn believe that they were responsible for everything they had, and they would forget God. Think about this. When, when we recognize, uh, acknowledge God, our constant joy is where? It's not in ourselves. It's in the Lord. It's in God. Not, not, in, not in His blessings. Now, we are thankful for the good things. We're thankful for the provisions that, that we have. We're thankful for those wonderful blessings. But God is the focal point of every good thing that happens to us. You know, it is so tempting to think of our own success and attribute such to our own uh, 
uh, doing and, and hard work and those types of things, accepting the praise for ourselves. It's tempting to do that. It's tempting to attribute our success even to that of chance. Uh, but that's not what we see Joseph doing, and he really teaches us something here in this chapter that, that, that give credit where credit is due, and that is give it to God. God the creator, God the provider. Give credit where credit is rightfully due, and that is God. Don't forget the provider. Don't forget the provider. Notice verses 33 down through verse 36 as well. Let's look at that. Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh and let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land may not perish during the famine. So here we have a plan that is being, uh, well, suggested, if you will. Uh, Joseph is, is presenting a plan to, to Pharaoh. And, and with such, Pharaoh is found in verse 37. Uh, the advice that is given here uh, is found to be good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of all uh, Pharaoh's servants. And so Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom is the Spirit of God? Now look at this. He found, Pharaoh found, the advice was good and even would acknowledge that Joseph was extraordinarily wise, okay? And would put Joseph as overseer of the situation. What we find Next is how Joseph went about in his service. Because what he does is he serves with God's wisdom, thereby fulfilling God's providential plan. You see, this is all in the making here. It's all in the making here. And, and, and I, I think that uh, some valuable uh, pieces uh, of, of of our lives, we think about this here, that that in the waiting rooms of life that Joseph has been in over the past 13 years as a slave, uh, prisoner, God has been preparing Joseph for this moment. Now, Joseph didn't see this years and years ago, uh, but but again, we think about it was all coming together. I mean, and again, we have the luxury of being able to look at, at, at this account and, and look at Joseph's life and be able to read, and we're like, oh, okay, we see it. Joseph was living right then in the here and now at his particular time. Over this period of time, Joseph, as I see it, had opportunity to grow and to mature. During the time from the pit to his prominent position as Potiphar's servant to the prison were all opportunities. They were all opportunities to learn some very valuable things, some valuable lessons. He would have become accustomed to the culture that was different than where he had come from. The language, being around very influential people, in service to them. I would say even management skills, uh, even. Y you know, that would help him in this next part that he would be endeavoring in. You know, I used the word earlier uh, in, association, in association with Joseph's character, and that was humility. And, and I, I think that, that verse that comes to my mind from the New Testament of 1 Peter 5, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, it says, Therefore, therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that, me, that he may exalt you in due time. You know, Joseph may have been through some very tough times and difficult circumstances, but there was some preparing going on during those times. And so you see over and over again that Joseph was truly 
humble in all of these times, uh, these experiences that he was going through, uh, very difficult and trying circumstances that he was uh, enduring. He was humble. But let me mention from verses 33 through 36 that we, we just noted there that this plan that Joseph proposed to Pharaoh was a very wise and it was a very manageable uh, plan. And again, recognize, uh, Pharaoh recognized that Joseph was serving with whose wisdom? Joseph's wisdom? No, God's wisdom. And, and I love the way that, that Joseph actually uh, gave this proposed plan to Pharaoh. Uh, you know, the way that he says there, he says, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt, verse 33. He goes on to talk about, uh, you know, let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land. He, you know, the one thing about it that strikes me there is that Joseph doesn't say, hey, you put me, uh, who's a wise and discerning man, over this task because I can make it happen. He doesn't do that. Again, we're talking about the humility here. He, he's saying, Pharaoh, you select you know, a, a discerning and wise man. You set him over the land of Egypt. And, and, and again, he goes through this plan here. That is someone, just like Pharaoh recognized, uh, which, that of Joseph. He's serving with God's wisdom, an humble mindset, an humble attitude. And with such, Joseph was, well... He was put in charge. He was put in charge. You see that in verses 39 through 45. You know, then Pharaoh said to Joseph, And as much as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring off his hand and put it on Joseph's hand, and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had, and they cried out before him, Bow the knee! So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath Penah, and he gave him as a wife, Esnath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. You know, it's, it's really interesting in, in those verses that all of this is happening. And, you know, again, we think about the providential plan that was, that was going on here. Uh, you know, Joseph being put in charge at this point. You know, Pharaoh... Uh, giving him his signet ring. And, and, and basically, the idea behind that is that Joseph's orders would have the same authority as the word of Pharaoh. And Joseph would be capable of authenticating uh, royal uh, documentation laws. I mean, I mean, look at all the things that Joseph was given at this point. I mean, garments of fine linen. Keep in mind, uh, you know, Joseph's already lost <laughs> two coats. Uh, one to his brothers and one to Potiphar's wife. Uh, but at this point, clothing is no longer an issue. He is given authority and basically the manager of Egypt. You know, Joseph is living uh, is, is a living example of what the Lord said in Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. He who is faithful and what is least is faithful also and much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Joseph, in all of these waiting rooms of his life and, 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 and all the things that he has uh, been going through, the trials, uh, the temptation, he has passed those tests. He has done well uh, in Potiphar's house and even in the prison. He served with God's wisdom and fulfilled God's plan for his life. But as we bring this study to a close, uh, and again, a lot, there's just a lot to consider, and, and only a few things I bring out in this, in this lesson. But I want you to notice with me that as Joseph served, that Joseph used his talents as a blessing to others. 
you know, in verses 48 and 49 of our, of our text, you notice that he is mentioned that, that Joseph gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the uh, land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities. He laid up uh, in every city the food of the fields which surrounded them. Joseph gathered very much grain as the sand of the sea until he stopped counting for it was immeasurable. And so Joseph is, is um, collecting uh, so much grain during the first seven years that they actually stopped measuring it. It was just immeasurable, it says there in that, in that passage. And in the last few verses of the text, we find that when the famine finally came, I, and I would, I would just uh, draw your attention there to, to that of uh, verse 54, it says that, uh, uh, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said, the famine was in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt, it says there was bread. There was bread. And we even find in the last few verses, verses 55 down through verse 57, that when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Then Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, whatever he says to you, do. The famine was over all the face of the earth, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians, and the famine became severe in the land of Egypt. So all countries, all countries came to Joseph in Egypt to buy grain because the famine was severe in all lands. In these verses, we find that as the famine continued to spread, people from all over were traveling to Egypt to purchase grain from Joseph. So by using his talents, Joseph served as a blessing to others. He served as a blessing. Do you remember God's statement to Joseph's father, Jacob, many years earlier? Do you remember what that statement was. And this takes us back several chapters in Genesis, actually. And Genesis chapter 28 and verse 14. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and the south. And in you and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I look at this and I'm thinking, wow, just looking at Joseph and how he used his talents, his abilities, his skills, and how he became a blessing to others, not just in a select region, but from all countries that came to them. I thought about today that we can serve God also, no matter what we do for a living or whether one's retired. All of us can serve God by being a blessing to others. We can do that. And we can touch many, many, many lives. Let me mention this. I don't believe Joseph would have made it to the palace if he would have failed to handle the pit and the prison times of his life. I don't believe he would have made it to the palace. Him keeping God in perspective in all circumstances, whether they were in his favor or not, was significant in Joseph's life, and it is in ours as well today, that although Joseph had been forgotten for uh, years by man, had been mistreated by man, uh, under, under, undergone injustices by man, God did not forget him. And I thought that if I could handle the pit and the prison parts of my life, the waiting rooms of life, as we have called them, such will determine us whether I make it to the palace. Don't forget what Paul said. I presented in the last lesson, this last, last Sunday evening in our study of part three. But I bring it up again in Romans 8 and verse 28 that it may be impressed upon our minds again. That Paul said, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. To those who are the called according to his 
purpose. You know, I would like to conclude uh, this part four of, of this lesson series uh, with some amazing similarities that we find between Joseph and Jesus. Um, both were loved by their fathers. Uh, both served as shepherds in at least one sense. Both were hated by their brothers. Both were taken to Egypt. Both were tempted. Both were sold for the price of a slave. Both had robes taken from them. Both were falsely accused. Both were tied up or chained at some point. Both were placed with two other prisoners, one of whom was saved and one of whom was lost. Both were 30 years old at the time their public service began. Both were lifted up at a time after a time of suffering. Both forgave those who had sinned against them. Both ended up saving their people. Joseph provided bread, as it states in this text of Genesis chapter 41. Jesus referred to himself as the bread of life. Joseph found favor in the sight of the chief jailer. It's the Roman centurion that said of Jesus, truly, this was the Son of God. And finally, what other people did to hurt both of them, God turned into good. I am certain there are more to be listed, but those are some interesting parallels that we find from the life of Joseph and Jesus. And for this evening, I think with this study and series so far, we can be grateful for Joseph. Some great life lessons that Joseph certainly gives us, doesn't it? However, we certainly are so much more thankful for Jesus because Jesus took our place on the cross. He gave his life on Calvary's cross for the remission of our sins to be able to give us an abundant life, even as John 10 and verse 10 states. And I hope that we have accepted that offer of salvation through faithful obedience. You know, we don't want to be like the Israelites, as I had mentioned earlier, where we forget the provider. We lavish in the blessings and the provisions that we are given. And we are very prideful people. Even in America, I think about the pride that runs rampant. But may we always remember that it's not about us. May we listen to what the Scriptures teach us. As Peter had said, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. We need to humble ourselves. We need to have that humility, just as Joseph did, and realize that through the pit and the prison times of our lives, whatever we want to call those, the trials and the temptations that we face, that we need to make sure that we lean upon God, that we trust in Him, that we take every opportunity to praise Him, not just only in the good times, but even in the bad, even in the storms, even in those trials and those temptations that we face, because He's the one who provides the way of escape. Yes, there may be uh, injustices, there may be things that man may do to us, but you know, God, in our humility, He will lift us up as we strive to do that which is good and right and acceptable in His sight. Great, great life lessons we learn from that of Joseph here in Genesis chapter 41. And as, we have, as I've stated, part four of this Life Lessons from Joseph series that we've been looking at. And that's the lesson from that chapter that I have for us today. I hope that we will uh, take these things to heart and to give, give credit where, where, where credit is due. That was the thing we learned. Give credit where credit's due. Give it to God. Give it to God. Let's serve with God's wisdom and fulfill the very plan that God has for us in this life. Let's use our talents as a blessing to others. Let's learn from this wonderful, wonderful example of Joseph that we have. I hope that this lesson has been encouragement to you. I hope that it has helped you as it has helped me.
and uh, check back with us. And over the next uh, few Sunday evenings, we will continue this series of life lessons from that of Joseph. And then again, there's just a lot about Joseph. You know, you can't just really put him into one simple lesson. Uh, there's just so much to grab from. So please, please uh, tune in and, and look at those lessons and study study the Bible with me in those and, and get those life applications there for us. And let's make the applications thereof. Thank you so much for joining me in this Bible study. And I hope you have a great day. God bless.